and I contrast it with if we didn't plan for the change, and I'm not talking about anticipation, that's part of it, but if we didn't help orchestrate it, then change is going to be upon us. Change may be going in the wrong direction or a not healthy direction. So. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Mid-America PTTC podcast. I'm your host, Dave Clausen, and I'm the director of the Mid-America Prevention Technology Transfer Center. Dr. David Anderson, Professor Emeritus of Education and Human Development at George Mason University is our guest for this episode. At Mason, he served as professor and director of the Center for the Advancement of Public Health. He acquired over 180 grants and contracts. Along with teaching courses on drug and alcohol issues, health communication, and community health. His professional work on drug and alcohol misuse, prevention, and wellness promotion spans over four decades. His specialties include strategic planning, program development, needs assessment and evaluation, along with health communication. His research, writing, and training emphasize leadership skills, grounded, and practical strategies and healthy environments to maximize organizational, group, and individual potential. We're also excited to be hosting him for our event on September 26th, titled Creating Change, Empowering the Leader Within. And for those listening, we would love to have you. You can find out more information about that event and register for the free training on our website. But before we get into the content today, we'd like to thank our funder, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration. And a quick note, although funded by SAMHSA, the content of this recording does not necessarily reflect the views of SAMHSA. Without further ado, let's get into the episode. All right, everyone. I would like to welcome David Anderson back to the podcast. David, thanks for joining us again. Glad to be here, Dave. Glad to be here. Uh, your your previous episode on the pyramid of success was so rich and full of value. Yeah, I, I was thrilled to have the chance to bring you back on for another another podcast episode. Um, but in case folks missed that last episode, would you mind uh, sharing a little bit more about your your background in relation to uh, the prevention field? Sure, I, I've been involved with alcohol and drug abuse prevention since, actually since 1975. I was in charge of a residence hall at Ohio State University. And frankly, what I saw around me was all sorts of, well, I saw a lot of, I had a lot of students. I had 700 students in the residence hall. And, and uh, the, the various problems that came across my desk and that I had to deal with, I'd say 90% were drug or alcohol related, whether it was violence or um, someone doing property damage or noise or whatever it was, typically alcohol or drugs. Uh, and so I, I, I and I saw a, a lot of students just having this activity that, frankly, in the mid '70s I hadn't heard of. It's an activity called drinking, and I know that sounds odd uh, as a young adult not hearing of an activity called drinking. I, you know, my view of drinking and from my college experience uh, was alcohol is a complement to, or can be a complement to activities. Uh, rather than the activity in and of itself. But that was a whole different setting for me. And so I offered a program in the residence hall and it took off. And so that was the very beginning of, of this. I called the program was called All About Getting a Good Healthy Buzz and Other Ways of Getting High. And believe it or not, I still have the, the flyer that I used. Uh, I had a student uh, volunteer that do the artwork on. It was done on a mimeograph machine uh, that dates me. Uh, but shortly thereafter, in terms of my background, a colleague and I, I was at Radford University in Virginia at the time, were wondering, I wonder what other colleges around the country are doing about alcohol issues. And so we decided to create a survey and we did a sample and we got a 50% response rate, learning what the policies and programs were around the country. And three years later, we said, I wonder what they're doing now. I wonder if things are different. So we updated the survey and distributed it to the same sample and we added other drugs and that became a trend for us. You know, we did it every three years and it's still going on. The most recent version is 2018 college alcohol survey. Um, many iterations later, we've added other drugs. We added tobacco, some violence issues. And it's really what, what are colleges doing? 
So during this time, that's some of the programming, some of the research that I was doing. And I started some writing and had a first book out, I think, in 1978. And uh, sadly, during my, my time at Ohio State, uh, I had, to, had a young lady overdose in the residence hall, and I helped carry her body out. And a couple of years later, I, I lost a couple of my staff members due to a drunk driver in the middle of a Saturday afternoon. And, um yeah, you know, it's just one thing led to another, and my graduate work was in public policy, and my dissertation was on drunk driving, and um, so that's my background. You know, I was initially a college administrator, and then a faculty member, and did a lot of community work, and a lot of research and writing about alcohol and drugs, wellness, health promotion, and I think the, the bottom line in, in all of that was taking the research and trying to make it applied, trying to make it practical, trying to make it understandable by someone who's not doing the research, mm -hmm. uh, trying to do that crossover between the theory and the research and the practice. Uh, so so it, it, my research is sitting up, a lot of the research is sitting up on my university website. For, uh, yeah, I retired from George Mason University a few years ago, and the website is still www.caph. Center for the Advancement of Public Health. Gmu. Edu, and um, so that's my background. Again, research, consultation, training, try to motivate people. Again, a prior podcast was on Pyramid of Success, which focused on competence, confidence, and commitment, and trying to help nurture that with with folks as they deal with alcohol and drug issues. Such a, a rich experience or background in prevention and uh, just the the experiences that you've lived have helped shaped your work and your life mission and thank you for doing the work that you do uh, thank you very important thank you. Um, thank you in the last episode the the pyramid of success and even just now we talked about you know leadership and you know, in prevention, you know, it's very real, serious work. And when it comes down to it, we're trying to save lives and create change. Uh, it might be trying to create some policy change or individual behavior change or environmental change. Uh, and the Pyramid of Success is a great framework um, for folks to do some self-reflection and reflection for their team to then focus on which areas to build, like that SWOT analysis. But when it comes mm -hmm. to really mm -hmm. trying to drive change or lead change, what would you suggest? What would be your, your recommendation for a framework or a model or a plan or a roadmap for success when it comes to driving change? Well, you know, I think, uh, yeah, I, I think you're exactly right. We all want change. There's something that we don't like. Whatever our role is, whether we're a parent or community leader or in our professional positions or we're working with a client or a patient or we want people to be healthier. I mean, you said, you know, we want to save lives. Yeah, we want to, we want to reduce the negative and we want to promote the positive. Mm -hmm. uh, and, the, and the promoting the positive can help reduce the negative, which is which is great. You know, it's more you know, resistance and re, and resiliency skills, if you will. But in terms of um, what might I suggest, I call this, and actually it's, it's not me calling it. It's a, a field of study called planned change. I mean, you you hear about strategic planning, but it's kind of a mouthful when you think of planned change. And I contrast it with if we didn't plan for the change, and I'm not talking about anticipation, that's part of it, but if we didn't help orchestrate it, then change is gonna be upon us. Change may be going in the wrong direction or a not healthy direction. So planned change is a field of study. And you know, to me, it, it, it goes back to that, the old seven Ps. You know, you've heard, you've heard it in a kind of a negative way, proper, prior planning prevents pathetically poor performance of seven Ps. Mm -hmm. You know, I'd like to reframe that into something positive, like uh, proactive preventative planning promotes positive processes and products. I mean, just to play with seven words or proactive participatory, I'm sorry, proactive participatory planning promotes 
positive preventive progress. So whatever you want to call it, being planful is is the name of the game. We're gonna, I'd like to talk about some ways of doing that. But since we do want change, we're more likely to get there if we're being planful and being orchestrated and organized than if we're not. You know, my, my background in college, I studied psychology and business administration. And this is really the blend of that, you know, the people stuff and the organization stuff. You know, my graduate works in public administration, public policy, which is really about you know, managing public affairs. And, and one of the fields of study that I studied um, and use to this day is helping to orchestrate planned change. And since we do want change, um, you know, so, so, you know, in the legal world, we hear the term due process. Mm -hmm. the, you know, the, the corollary to that is what processes do. You know, you know, due process is needed for this person. Well, what process is due? Mm -hmm. I'd say the same thing for this, you know, plan change. It's healthy to think about plan change. So then the question is, what sort of planning is appropriate for us to do? rather than let it happen to us. You know, I remember a sign over the door in graduate school that says, are you doing it or is it doing you? Well, you know, rather, you know, rather than having it, it, whatever the it is, do you, um, let's, let's try to take charge. Let's try to orchestrate some sort of planning. What's, you know, let's try to uh, engage in a helpful and engaged process, engaged with other people. Uh, to try to make a difference, to create the change that we want. Mm -hmm. Just that, that piece of intentionality. Exactly. Uh, yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Very much so. And I actually try to apply that to just my life as a whole, to personal development and growth too, being very intentional about growing and learning. Uh, but I love this this topic, this, this body of work. Um, when it comes down to... The, the specific process, mm -hmm. what might that look like? Yeah. You know, there's lots of different planning processes. There's lots of them. There's not one best strategic planning process. You can read different volumes and, you know, the five-step model, the six-step model, the eight-step model, whatever. Uh, let me just offer a couple. You know, when, when we're talking about drug and alcohol abuse prevention, SAMHSA, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, has the strategic prevention framework. That's really good. That's really good. I mean, it's, you have five elements in a circle, and, and, and they're all circling around sustainability and cultural competence. You know, they have five elements, and, and there's some tools that go with each of these. There's a booklet out. Uh, you know, way of assessment, capacity, planning, implementation, and evaluation. Uh, you can jump into it at any point, uh, whether you're a brand new coalition or a group, or you're been around for a year or two or decades. Uh, I did something about 20 years ago with some colleagues. We call it an action planner. Uh, it was eight steps. Well, there's a lot of parallel to the strategic prevention framework. Uh, we started with establishing a task force, which means don't try to do it alone. You know, it might be an advisor group. Uh, determine guiding principles, which I think is very important. You know, what are some of the principles of, of what's important uh, for you? You know, you want to be inclusive or you want to be secretive? Do you want to have, do you have a budget? Do you have a timeline? Uh, what is something, anything that might be a guiding principle? So we want to ensure cultural competence. That's why it was at the center of a strategic plan uh, prevention framework. So that's the second. Third is set your vision and goals. That's pretty typical in strategic planning. Clarify your needs and assess resources was our fourth step there. What are the needs that are local? Don't just plop something in. Try to have it based on your local needs and identify the resources you already have and where you have gaps. Uh, fifth is prioritize action because you might identify dozens of things, but you can't do them all. Articulate and market, which means get your message out, clearly define your message, what you want someone in your audience or your intermediaries to know, feel, or do. Coordinate, which is very important for any sort of planning, is who's going to do what and when. Mm -hmm. And then try to institutionalize, which again is part of what 
the strategic prevention framework does with sustainability, institutionalized, try to stay with it for the future. Again, that particular resource on my university website at caph.gmu.edu, um, it was built for alcohol and college campuses, alcohol abuse prevention and college campuses. I know of places that have used it for non-alcohol issues because we have a lot of worksheets in there. Mm -hmm. And I know of places that are not colleges that have used it. So the idea of cross-fertilization using for other settings is fine. But think about those. Those are two different frameworks. There's no one best strategic planning process. Um, and, I th and again, I think all of those elements are important to, to look at, think about, reflect on, but come up with your process that works for you locally. Uh, the, 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 the biggest, if you will, not drawback, but the biggest concern I have with people who don't really do good planning is they just, they just say, oh, I want to deal with this issue. Let's do X or Y. They jump into an activity. They jump into an initiative. They jump into a policy without thinking through the guiding principles, their overall vision, their overall priorities, uh, their own capacity. So, uh, so it's a matter of taking the time, investing in the time to do good planning. On the other hand, don't plan for five years. Uh, it's an open process, just like the SPF is from SAMHSA. It's an open process. Keep renewing it. But, you know, part of your own guidelines, your own guiding principles might be, you know, we need to have a public presence within three months, within six months, within one year. Fine. Whatever your guiding principles, let's, ha let's get going out there. Let's not plan for three years. We're going to keep planning, but, you know, we've got to start doing. So I think whatever your process is, agree to it with your group and then start doing it and just be prepared. It is, it does take a lot of work, but the rewards are definitely there. Yes, indeed. And I'll come, I'm going to circle back to guiding principles. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But uh, I, th I think you hit it very well, you know, having a formal process because the, the power behind creating change, the power comes from the process. I mean, it really, Absolutely. That's where it is. And yes, folks need to stay true to whatever process they, they select. And uh, the, the spiff, I really like how the graphic is in that, the flower yeah. circle, because it is an ongoing process. I was working with one client and they said, oh yeah, we did the spiff, you know, years ago, we're good. Like, you need to revisit that and continuously run through your planning process, evaluate, assess, see where you're at. It's not just a one and done kind of check sheet to do. Exactly, exactly, exactly. And uh, I probably would really like to stress too, uh, coming from my, my days in the army, we always said slow is smooth and smooth is fast. Often right. folks will want to just right. rush through like the capacity. Exactly. Um, or, you know, so they can get to the, the fun stuff, the programs, but you've got to right. stay true to the process and work each one. Um, yeah. Yes. But, yeah. You know, it's, it, the process is so important. You own what you help create. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. I, I love that. And uh, yeah. I'm, right. I'm so glad you unpacked and highlighted guiding principles. Um, I agree. It's often sort of pushed aside or, rush through but there's so much value and importance in yeah. coming together and creating those guiding principles and i was actually doing a leadership workshop just the other day and we we're talking about you know guiding principles and both yeah. personal guiding principles your personal values your core values and then also for your group your organization and i really wanted to highlight too that it's not just a come together, okay, these are our guiding principles, but revisit them, talk about them, keep them in the right. forefront of your mind and make sure you're living by, you're living out those principles. Yeah. Often with a, a mission statement, a vision statement, those guiding principles, they could put in like a, a manual and then right. revisit right. it again. But you've got to make sure you're living those out. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yes. And glad you, glad you pulled that out. And 
what would uh, some of the key elements be? You know, which ones would you like to highlight or? Yeah, you know, you know, when you think about whether it's the SPF or the action planner that I co-authored a few years or a couple decades ago, you know, some things are, are, are pretty common to them. First of all, think about your ultimate aims, your goals, your objectives, some activities. Think about all those. Don't just hone in on the activities. Just think about the overall package. Mm-hmm. Uh, think about the guiding principles. That's so important. Uh, some of those might be how you operate, like the process, like having youth involved or having outside agencies involved or um, just whatever that's, you know, your timeline, your resources. Think about in all of this, the resources you have, the timetables, responsibilities. You see that with all sorts of strategic planning worksheets. Uh, and, and all of that's wrapped around the theme of accountability. Mm. Uh, incorporate obstacles. You know, when you're thinking about strategic planning, plan change, what are the obstacles? What are the challenges that are out there? And and think about ways of negating those or addressing those or overcoming the obstacles. But But be planful about the obstacles. Could be time. It mm. could be resources. It could be... Um, current mindset of people. You know, how do you address that? Um, you know, think about when you're thinking about the planning process, plan change, think about outcomes and processes. When we talk about plan change, that means change, that means moving some needle. What's that needle? What are the indicators of success, short term and long term? But also think about processes. Again, that's the engagement. It's the engagement of uh, people in the community, people in our task force, people in our audiences. Um, and then, again, with plan change, we're constantly evolving. So in this year, you have some evaluation, you have some review, you're taking stock of how it's gone with your results and your processes and what can improve. So always looking towards improvement because we're always looking towards change and again, trying to be better. And again, as we said at the beginning, it's not just saving lives. It's also being more proactive and more positive. Mm -hmm. uh, Quick little shout out to the great lakes PTTC. They have developed a change leader Academy based on the Mm -hmm. NIATICS planning model that they had originally created at their ATTC. Uh, So folks, if you're interested, check out the Great Lakes PTTC website or shoot me an email and I'll connect you with them. Um, So sort of back to this though, uh, how would you define or describe the role of a community leader when it comes to plan change? You know, I I think it's, it's actually very simple. Just be committed to the process, some process. SPF, sure. You know, Anderson and Milgram's action planner, sure. Some other action planning process or strategic planning process or plan change process, sure. Just be committed to something. Help guide and nurture it. You know, engage others in that process. Make sure it's engaged planning. It's not just my way or the highway or top down. Um, Again, others say, you know, we, we, we want to do better and we want to be planful about it. Here's a process. I'd like to initiate this. If you're the designated leader or if you're a participant or have something to offer, share it and say, if, we, if not this process, let's find another one. And, and then don't shortcut the early steps. Like you've emphasized, I emphasize the guiding principles. Don't short step that. Mm-hmm. Uh, don't shortcut it. You know, try to spend some time knowing that it's going to be a process that's going to take time. There are different points of view. Try to engage people to find some sort of common ground. Uh, Chuck finds ultimately some shared visions. That, to me, that's the role of the community leader. Mm-hmm. Uh, ab- absolutely. And uh, I feel I was going to ask what are some of the important points about plan change, but I feel like you really just highlighted a bunch of them there. Uh, any any other sort of last little bullet points you'd like to add as far as? Um, well, it's a, you know, bottom line, it's a process. It mm-hmm. takes time, it takes patience. Mm-hmm. It may have more steps than you think are needed. You might think you only need two steps or three steps. Uh, it helps create buy-in. It helps create buy-in. Um, and then I, I think it's really a demonstration of leadership that you engage in some sort of process, again, like SPF or something else. 
you know, it's a, we're never going to solve the drug and alcohol issue. We can better manage it. So I, I really do think that uh, plan change is a, a real way of moving forward and making a difference. Um, and again, it's, it's part of our primitive success, competence, confidence, and commitment. Being planful is essential. And to me, that's what constitutes an effective leader. Yes, indeed. And I, I love that you hit on buy-in and a demonstration of leadership. I have folks always ask, how can I engage my community members or coalition members? How can I really you know, increase their buy-in? Well, by leading them. And one way to do that is to have a structured process, drive some plan change. So I, I love that you included that. Um, yeah. any, any sort of last final thoughts before we wrap this episode up? The only thing I would say is stick with it. Stick with it. It's, you know, be thoughtful, be reflective. Um, and, you know, by being planful, I think that really helps us be more successful because that, that's what we want. Mm-hmm. We want success. Have hope, have trust in the process, um, engage in it, reflect on it. And, uh, you know, I think success is, is, uh, is the outcome. Yes, indeed. And, you know, the power is in the process. And again, I want to remind folks, you know, it's, this isn't a one person job, you know, come together as a team. We're all in this together. And what's great about the new PTTC model is that you now have direct access to a national network. We're here to be a connection hub. If you need support or you need some knowledge to really build your, your confidence or your competence or your commitment. We're here to help each other because we're all on the same team. Uh, and I want to do another little shout out. Uh, David Anderson and Carlton Hall will be coming to Kansas City uh, in September on the 26th, 2019. Uh, they have teamed up to bring you a wonderful, rich, and engaging leadership event. Um, cre- cre- creating change, empowering the leader within, because we are all leaders in some aspect, whether you're at the community level as a volunteer, clear up to a state level leader. We're all trying to lead change, plan to change. Uh, So I'll include more information on that, the links to David's website and to the registration for that event in the show notes. And thank you again, David, for your time, your expertise, and bringing so much value to our region. Thank you very, very much. Thank you, Dave. Thank you for hosting this. It's been my pleasure, and I wish everyone great success.